Hello everyone and welcome to VMware Lab. My name is Mahar Al Asfar. I'm a Cloud Management Staff SE with VMware. In this video, we will be covering how to set up multi-tenancy for vRealize Automation 8.1, leveraging Lifecycle Manager 8.1. So let's jump right in. The agenda for this demo will start with multi-tenancy uh, overview and then taking a look at the setup requirements for both single deployment and cluster deployment of vRealize Automation 8.1. Moving on to, after that, to walking you through uh, the setup workflow, everything from the DNS records, the SAN certificate, applying these certificates to enable tenancy, and then adding the desired tenants that we build these requirements around. Once we do that, we'll move on and validate the tenants, VIDM and VRA instances that we've created. And at the end of the video, we'll take a look at the vRealize orchestrator options that are available to us for multi-tenancy. The latest release of vRealize Suite Lifecycle Manager 8.1 supports dedicated infrastructure multi-tenancy for VMware vRealize Automation 8.1. Enabling the provider organization, or call it the default tenant organization, or the master org organization, cloud administrators to create and manage tenant organization and allocate infrastructure to these tenants. By offering unmanaged, partially managed, or fully managed infrastructure to the tenants really based on how the identity and access management is set up. An example here would be for uh, the infrastructure can be shared if the provider is actually set up to be the org owner for the tenants it's managing. The overall benefits uh, for our VRA customers, it offers them more flexibility, control, and security around uh, in, uh, enabling and setting up the dedicated infrastructure multi-tenancy. Now let's take a look at the requirements uh, for enabling multi-tenancy for a single deployment. In this scenario, we have three appliances being LCM, IDM, and VRA. And the desired state is that we wanna establish our default tenant, which is our provider org, and then two additional tenants being tenant-1 and tenant-2, representing the tenant orgs. Let's first talk about the DNS requirements for this. Every deployment of VRA uh, uh, will need the A-type records. So this is basically representing the um, uh, main A-type records needed even before you actually start the deployment. So uh, an FQDN for LCM, an FQDN for IDM, and an, FQ, F, an FQDN for the VRA rep representing the host name for these appliances and their respected IP addresses. Now the, uh, the multi-tenancy A-type records that we're creating specifically for enabling multi-tenancy is uh, first, uh, because we have a default tenant, we're creating a namespace, uh, uh, an FQDN for the default dash tenant uh, within our domain, so default dash tenant vmw lab .local. and then two additional uh, FQDNs, one for tenant one and one for tenant two, and as you can see, they're all three are pointing to the physical IP address of the identity manager appliance. These host names will be used to access each of those VIDM instances, respectively. On the side, on the VRA side, we create multi-tenancy C name type records that specifically for ten tenant one and tenant two. Uh, what we do here is we actually add uh, or use the VRA uh, uh, namespace in the single deployment, which is the main FQDN of the VRA appliance, and we uh, we define tenant dash one and tenant dash two dot VRA dot VMW lab dot local and point time as you can see point it to the main FQDN of the VRA appliance, which is vra.vmwlab.local. On the SAN certificate requirements, we'll create two certificates. The first certificates is the VIDM certificate that will apply on the IDM uh, appliance. And uh, the one thing to make sure here when we're creating the SAN certificate, we wanna make sure that the host name 
includes the main FQDN of the IDM appliance, the default dash tenant host name that we've created for the provider org, and tenant one and tenant two host names uh, that we've created for tenant one and tenant two. And as you can see, we're pointing to the IP address, uh, the physical IP address again of the IDM appliance, which by the way, is really optional. I personally like to put it uh, and document that in the SAN certificate, uh, just to, you know, in case, uh, so if you're looking at the SAN certificate, you know what IP addresses it's pointing to. The second certificate is the VRA certificate and the host name here should include uh, the main FQDN of the VRA appliance, and then the two CNAME records that we've created uh, representing the VRA for tenant one and VRA for tenant two. And the IP address, again, is the physical IP address uh, uh, of the VRA appliance, which again is optional. Now, if you do wanna make things a little bit more simpler to manage in terms of certificates, you have the option to use wildcards. On the VIDM side, you can use asterisk.vmwlab.local in this example, since there's only one domain namespace. But on the VRA side, we have to add both vmwlab.local and vra.vmwlab.local since we have two domain namespaces. Now, moving on, let's take a look at the requirements for enabling multi-tenancy for a cluster deployment. In this scenario, we have our one LCM appliance. We have our three IDM appliances because we're creating a cluster, a VIDM cluster. The appliances are IDM1, IDM2, and IDM3. And then we have our three VRA appliance representing the VRA cluster, and that's being VRA1, VRA2, and VRA3. The desired state here is pretty much the same. We're establishing the default tenant which represents our provider org. And the two additional tenants, tenant-1 and tenant-2, representing the tenant orgs. Now let's take a look at the DNS requirement for all uh, these uh, seven uh, appliances and including the records that we need for multi-tenancy. The main A-type records for all seven appliances, of course, is gonna be created. So one for LCM, the three IDM appliances, and the three VRA appliances, all uh, pointing to their respected IP addresses. In addition to the seven appliances, FQDNs, we are creating two additional records, one for uh, IDM load balancer, so IDM-LB, that will be fronting the three IDM appliances and one for VRA, VRA-LB load balancer that will be fronting all three VRA uh, appliances. The multi-tenancy specific A record types is pretty much the same as the single deployment. The only difference is that if you notice, the IP address is really pointing to the IDM load balancer IP address. So uh, uh, so all three, the default dash tenant, tenant one and tenant two, which by the way, again, represents the host name that is going to be used to access uh, the VIDM instance for each of those tenants. On the VRA side of things, uh, the multi-tenancy C name type records we're creating here for tenant dash one and tenant dash two. Because we have three appliances, we can't really tie the name to any specific node, VRA node. Therefore, the namespace here we're creating is really tenant-1 around the vra-lb.vmwlab.local and we're pointing both CNAME records to point to the load balancer FQDN, the VRA load balancer FQDN, vra-lb.vmw.local. Now on the SAN certificate requirements side of things, uh, for VIDM, we create two certificates for VIDM. One that applies on the uh, cluster of nodes, of the VIDM nodes. Uh, we wanna make sure here that the host name in the SAN certificate includes all three FQDN for the IDM nodes, IDM1, IDM2, and IDM3. And in addition to the multi-tenancy A-type records or records that we've created for default dash tenant representing the provider org and tenant one and tenant two and configure the IP address uh, field uh, 
with the uh, uh, the three IP addresses from the three nodes, IDM1, IDM2, IDM3. As you can see, the respected IPs are listed within the IP address field. The second VIDM related certificate will apply on the load balancer. The uh, An important point here for this load balancer, for the VIDM specifically load balancer, is that we have to configure it with SSL termination. So uh, when you create the SAN certificate that you're going to apply on the load balancer, you have to make sure that the host name includes the FQDN for the IDM-LB, which is the load balancer FQDN, and then the uh, all three uh, uh, A-type records that we've created for VIDM, which uh, represents the default-tenant for the provider org and tenant1 and tenant2. And the IP address here will be the IP address of the physical IP address of the load balancer, the IDM load balancer. Now let's move on to the VRA side. Uh, there is only one certificate that you need for VRA and I'll, I'll mention why in a second. The SAN certificate here, you wanna make sure that the host name includes all three uh, FQDN uh, of the VRA appliances. So VRA one, two, and three, and including the VRA-LB uh, uh, VMWLab.local and the two C name records that we've created uh, for tenant one and tenant two in the VRA-LB VMWLab.local domain namespace. The IP address should be configured with all three IP addresses of the physical appliance, VRA appliances uh, that, uh, within the VRA cluster. The VRA load balancer should be configured here with SSL pass-through. Therefore, there is no requirement for any kind of certificate to be applied or created. Again, if you wanna make things simpler to manage from a certificate perspective, you can always use wildcard. And in this scenario, you can still continue to use uh, the wildcard for both uh, on the VIDM side certificate or the load balancer uh, VIDM certificate, you can use the asterisk.vmw.local uh, since there's only one domain namespace. And on the VRA side, uh, you can create, you have, you can use asterisk.vmw.local and asterisk.vra-lb.vmwlab.local since there are two domain namespace in this scenario. Now let's take a look at the multi-tenancy setup workflow. Uh, for a single deployment. These are the steps and uh, in a specific order. First, we need to create the DNS records, both A and C, C name type records required for multi-tenancy. Create or import the SAN certificate we talked about for both VIDM and VRA. Apply the VIDM certificate first on the instance in a single deployment or the cluster in a cluster deployment. Move on to executing the enable tenancy wizard to enable multi-tenancy in LCM 8.1. Then go and apply the VRA SAN certificate on the VRA instance uh, in, uh, in terms of single deployment or the cluster if we have a cluster deployment. Then we can now move on and add the tenants or the desired tenants using the add tenant wizard in LCM 8.1 to configure our tenants. Once our, our tenants are created, we can go and validate the tenant accessibility for both uh, instances of VIDM and VRA. All the above tasks are performed really by the provider admin. Also to note here that moving forward uh, uh, in this demo, the multi-tenancy setup workflow that we're going to showcase will be based on single deployment architecture. Let's talk first about DNS records. Uh, I've used Microsoft DNS. Uh, the screenshot here is uh, a list of the records that I've created for uh, this demonstration. And as I mentioned earlier, I've created three uh, main A type records uh, for our LCM, IDM, and VRA appliances, basically pointing to the physical IP address for each of the appliances. Uh, for the specific multi-tenancy records, I've created, created default-tenant uh, for our provider org and then tenant-1 and tenant-2 for our tenant orgs. And as you can see, uh, uh, all three records are really pointing to the physical IP address of the VIDM appliance. 
On the VRA side, I've created two C, C name records uh, that represents tenant one and tenant two, and I've created tenant-one.vra and tenant-two.vra, both pointing to the physical FQDN of the VRA appliance. Now, in case of a cluster deployment, which we're not covering here uh, uh, in, the, in the slides, is that both VIDM and VRA tenant-based FQDN that we are showing here will be actually pointing to a load balancer. Uh, those two load balancer is, uh, one is fr fronting the VIDM nodes and one, uh, the other load balancer is the one that's fronting all the VRA uh, nodes. A uh, couple of things here to note is that the VIDM load balancer has to be configured with SSL termination. The two certificates for uh, the VIDM and the VIDM load balancer has to apply uh, uh, on both uh, the VIDM cluster and uh, its uh, load balancer respectively. As for the VRA load balancer, uh, that will be configured with SSL pass-through. Uh, and the certificate has to only apply on the VRA cluster since uh, there's no requirements uh, for a certificate for the load balancer since, again, it's configured with SSL pass-through. Now let's move on to the multi-domain SAN certificates. To do this, we in LCM 8.1, we'll, we'll, we'll need to use the locker service. The local service is the service in LCM that actually allows us to manage certificate, licenses, and password. Once we log in into the locker service in LCM, we'll select the certificate menu and we'll click generate to generate our two certificates that we need, one for VIDM and one for VRA. On the VIDM side, we want to make sure that the host name, like we mentioned before, includes the required FQDN, and that is the main IDM FQDN, and the three uh, uh, orgs that we've created, one being the default dash tenant for our provider org, and one being tenant one and tenant two for our tenant orgs. Of course, the IP address they're pointing to here is the main or the physical IP address of the IDM uh, appliance since this is based on a single deployment architecture like I mentioned. The IP address is really optional. I personally like to uh, leave it in there for documentation purposes so it's part of the certificate. For the VRA certificate uh, we use the host name. Uh, again uh, the required names for the VRA side is the main VRA FQDN and the two CNAME records that we've created for tenant 1 and tenant 2. And of course, all three pointing to the physical IP address of the VRA appliance, since again, this is a single deployment architecture. The IP address is optional, and I am putting it in there so it's documented with a certificate. If you happen to look at the details of the certificate one day, you know what IP address is being, is being used. We mentioned this already, and uh, to make things simpler, you can always use wildcards. So on the left-hand side with VIDM, I can use, uh, instead of uh, uh, the SAN-specific hostname, I can use a wildcard. So I can use asterisk.vmwarelab.local, since there's only one domain namespace. And on the VRA side, since there's two domain namespace here, uh, I'm gonna, I can use asterisk.vmwarelab.local and asterisk.vra.vmwarelab.local. Now, once that's complete, we'll have the two certificates ready to go. And um, once the two certificates for VIDM and VRA are ready to be applied, along with having all the DNS and SAN certificate requirements we covered, you're ready now to go in and enable multi-tenancy. One really important note here I'd like to mention is that any time uh, you plan on creating or adding additional tenants, both certificates will need to be recreated and reapplied. Okay, so now uh, let's take a look at how we are going to apply first the VIDM certificate. To do that, we need to get into the lifecycle operation service with an LCM. Uh, go to the Environments menu and uh, view the details on the global environment that is hosting the VIDM 3.3.2 uh, uh, instance of VIDM. Once we get in, uh, we can use the side uh, uh, three dot menu uh, 
uh, and select the replace certificate action. The wizard here will take us through five steps. So first we're gonna take a look at the current certificate uh, configuration that we're replacing. And as you can clearly see, the subject alternative name does not have all the required name uh, FQDN namespaces or FQDN names that we require uh, within the certificate. So, uh, you know, the reason why we're replacing the certificate in the first place. We'll hit next. We select the VIDM certificate that has those requirements in the host names. And that's the VIDM certificate. As you can see, the subject alternative name does include the main IDM uh, host name and uh, uh, the provider org and the tenant org host names. Hit next. Anytime we replace or update the certificate, we require to re-trust uh, on products that are already configured with VIDM. So I made sure that the only instance that I have here, uh, which is VRA 8.1, which I'm doing this test for, uh, is the only product, other product that I need to retrust. So I uh, simply check the box next to it. If I did have Log Insight or Vialize Operation or other SDDC products, I would also have to select them so they can retrust the new certificate that I'm applying. After that, we hit next. We can opt in for a snapshot. This is recommended to enable to make sure that Vialize Lifecycle Manager can roll back in case of any failure. If you actually fail to select this opt in for snapshot and something, uh, a failure happened of some sort, you will, you will be in an inconsistent uh, state and uh, uh, you cannot re -re uh, you know, roll back and it will be irrecoverable uh, state in case of failure. So I made sure that I selected the snapshot. Uh, after that, we go to the pre-check. We run the pre-check. We have two uh, uh, classes here. The first class is to be able to enable snapshot for rollback, and you can see that's passed. And then the validation within the VIDM, for VIDM in the global environment, we have a few uh, uh, that passed and a few warnings. The first warning here is really not a warning, but more like a consent that since you opt in for a snapshot, the product will shut down to take that snapshot. So we have to accept that consent that we know that the VIDM will, will be rebooted and that there will be some impact. So once you're ready here, the other warning is okay. Uh, we already selected to reestablish trust. So we're covered there. And then we hit uh, finish to apply the VIDM certificate. On the slide, I just simply captured the 17 different stages that uh, the applying the VIDM certificate has to go through end-to-end uh, uh, -end to apply the certificate. So this is just for uh, FYI uh, purposes. What I really want to uh, 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 focus on is the last stage, which is number 17, which is the VRA VA initialize cluster. Any time in the deck you see VRA VA initialized cluster, what that means is that LCM is going to shut down all the VRA services and restart all the ser services back up. So we're simply we're not rebooting the appliance, but we're restarting the services, and which will obviously take time. In my uh, test here, uh, it took 41 minutes, almost 42 minutes, to apply the VIDM certificate on one appliance. Uh, and of course, the time may 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 be different uh, uh, since I'm not using enterprise class hardware here. Uh, the main thing is for me is you really have to wait for replacing the VIDM certificate task to finish and fully complete before moving on to enabling tenancy. And the reason why is that that last stage that I mentioned, where you can see in the screenshot, it took about 23 minutes. Uh, since it had to restart all the VRA services. So to make sure once this is complete, make sure that VRA is operational by simply just going to HTTPS VRA dot VMW lab dot local in my scenario here. Once that's done, we can, uh, as the uh, uh, provider admin, now I can go in and uh, uh, use the identity and tenant management service in LCM to enable the tenancy. Uh, so we go in and we would select the tenant management. The tenant management uh, has some guidelines here in terms of what uh, the recommendation would be, which what this demonstration was built on. So simply we enable the tenancy so we can kick off the wizard.
The minute you go in and before you proceed, once you hit the enable tenancy button, uh, you have to complete uh, some mandatory actions. The first one is that you have to, to consent and check the box that you have taken a snapshot of the VMware Identity Manager before performing this operation, just in case. Also, it's mandatory to perform an inventory sync before starting this operation, just to make sure that the inventory is up to date. Uh, and no drift or change in the environment outside of LCM have happened uh, during before you uh, uh, enabling tenancy. So we go ahead and check, uh, select the box and trigger the inventory sync. And once it's complete, we can hit proceed. Here, uh, this is very important. This is where we start enabling the tenancy operation where we will change some configurations in the identity manager instance or in the main Identity Manager instance, which is the provider instance, which is the default tenant. In the master tenant, what we want to do here is the master tenant alias is actually your default dash tenant that we've, the, uh, the records, the A type records that we've created for default dash tenant, which is representing our provider org. So as you can see in the master tenant alias, I've actually put in default dash tenant and in yellow, a warning message uh, that's stating all the requirements that you need to make sure that it's there before proceeding, before enabling the tenancy. And you can see here, it's asking us that you need an A name DNS record, which we did. Uh, make sure the VMware identity certificate either holds a wildcard or a SAN matching uh, 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 host names, which we did. Also, if, if it happens that the uh, uh, provider admin went ahead and wanted to uh, uh, enable tenancy without looking at any documentation or without prior knowledge, there's a mandatory warning here. There's the third warning that you have to add VMware Identity Manager certificate to the locker and, uh, and replace uh, the product certificate before you can you know, enable tenancy. So. Um, um, uh, this is a, a clear warning that there is a bunch of mandatory steps and requirements that you have to have uh, ready before you actually click to enable tenancy. The second uh, half of the of the of this page is product re uh, registration. Again, we only have virtualized automation in this set, in this uh, environment. So uh, the any products that is currently integrated with the base or the master or the global identity manager that belongs to the provider organization, that's our base organization, will need to do a re-registration against the master tenant alias. Since now, what happened is, for example, the existing VMware identity manager is idm.vmwarelab.local before, before enabling tenancy. And the alias that we've created uh, through the, some of the requirements that we went through, uh, what we created an alias uh, or a given alias called default-tenant that's going to represent our provider org or our default tenant. Post enablement, what, what will happen is VMware Identity Manager FQDN will change to default-tenant.vmwarelab.local. So any clients communicating with VIDM will now have to start communicating through this new uh, uh, FQDN and, and, and that is default-tenant.vmwarelab.local and instead of the old original host name or FQDN name, which was idm.vmwarelab.local. Hope that's clear. Once we hit the enable tenancy, we go through four uh, uh, stages that I documented here. The first one being enable multi-tenancy, enable uh, tenancy VIDM FQDN update, uh, update the auth provider host and then my favorite here is VRA VA initialized cluster like I mentioned we're shutting down all the VRA services and we're restarting them at the end um, you have you can track the request and see more details by clicking on the here link that's going to take you to the request details in my case the elapsed time for this uh, enabling tenancy workflow uh, was 37 minutes and 29 seconds Again, uh, I really want to uh, emphasize that you have to wait for enabling this tenancy task to fully complete before you move on to applying the VRA certificate, which is the next step that we have to do after this. Since, like I mentioned in step four, which as you can see, takes about 20 minutes, 23 minutes in my, in my, in my lab, uh, 
uh, uh, where we go through and restart all VRA services. So after this is complete, make sure that VRA is operational by simply going to the to the the provider or uh, the VRA uh, link, which is HTTPS uh, VRA VMware Lab local. Now, after we've completed the enable tenancy successfully, we need to move on to the next step, and that's applying the VRA certificate. And we do that through the Lifecycle Operations Service in LCM. But this time, we will view the details of the VRA, uh, of the environment that, uh, that is hosting the VRA uh, product or VRA 8.1 product. Once we view the details, we'll hit on the three dot menu and select the replace certificate action. This will take us through three steps. First, we're gonna take a look at the current certificate details. And again, you can see that the subject alternative names uh, it does not have all the required host names that we've uh, prepared. In this, in, in this case, it would be the CNAME records that we, we were created. So we'll go next, select the VRA certificate that we prepared to apply on the VRA appliance and uh, simply run the pre-check to make sure that we don't have any issues. We do have a warning and that's okay because we will be retrusting or establishing a trust between the suite products as part of this workflow. And once we're ready, we'll hit finish and then we'll go through uh, the, uh, the stages. In my uh, home lab, again, it took about 20 minutes, 21 minutes. Uh, once again, uh, in the first step, uh, the services, VRA services will be shutting, uh, will, will, will shut down and restart. Therefore, again, you have to wait for the three stages to complete uh, before you move on to uh, adding uh, the tenant uh, task. Before we can add the tenants, we have to make sure that VRA is up and running since the services on the VRA uh, has been shut down and restarted. Once VRA is up and running and we're good to go, this time we can add tenants, finally. And uh, back uh, into the identity and tenant management as the provider admin, we can now go to the tenant, tenant management menu and simply click on add tenant. This will kick the uh, wizard for adding tenant. First, uh, we'll add the tenant details. So here, uh, since the requirements that we've created from DNS record and certificate, uh, uh, We've already defined the tenant, tenant-1 and tenant-2. That's where what we have to name the tenant here, and therefore I'm, t I'm naming this tenant, the first tenant, tenant-1. Uh, and for the administrator details, these are the tenant admin uh, information. So I'm creating a tenant admin uh, with the name tenant-1.admin, first name, last name, email, and uh, the password. And then next I'm going to uh, click on uh, that I want to migrate directories from the base tenant, which is my provider tenant, which is my master tenant. Uh, so this is uh, initially what you have to do here is, ass this is assuming that we already had a directory set up with LCM for the base tenant. So I did add VMware lab uh, Active Directory domain uh, uh, in the base tenant. And what I'm doing here is I'm checking the box that I want to copy and migrate that directory. If I had more directory, I would be able to select one or more directories to copy to this tenant that I'm creating currently. Uh, once I have a list of the tenants uh, that was uh, <clears throat> that are available for me in the base tenant or the provider org, I can select the domain, provide the bind password and the domain admin, and simply hit validate. Once the validation is successful, I can move on to the product association step, and that's where I can select the product where this tenant needs to be synced. Um, in our scenario, we only have one VRA instance that is registered to the to the LCM, so I can't see any other product that I that I can associate the tenant except the one that we have here. But if I did have multiple uh, instances where I wanted to, uh, uh, when I wanted the tenant, this tenant to have access to, I would select them all here as as product uh, to associate with with this tenant. On the right hand side, under the recommendation, you can see that we're also making making sure that the whoever the that the provider admin that's adding the tenant have already fulfilled the requirements for making sure that the CNAME DNS records are added and the certificates are taken care of. So we've already done that ahead of time, uh, but uh, these are just a reminder of the recommendation uh, that's needed to add the tenant that you just uh, created. 
Finally, run pre-check. If there's any issue, go back and fix it. In our scenario, all, all uh, validation passed for this, the creation of this tenant. I, I've, I've basically completed all the requirements and I'm ready to save and exit. Look at the summary of what I've created, the name of the tenant, who is the tenant admin, the directory uh, that I copied over to this tenant. It could be one or more directories and the product uh, and I, that I associated this tenant with. Also, it can be one or more products. Once that's uh, completed, uh, we'll, uh, t uh, the creation will be in progress and I can uh, select view to look at the request details. And in our case here, it literally took two minutes to finish that. Once the, uh, so I repeated already the same process that I just described for tenant two. So, so it's not repetitive. So you can see here now I have two tenants, tenant one and tenant two. So tenant dash one and tenant dash two. At this stage of this demonstration, what we're going to do is actually explore tenancy and look at some of the day two operations so, uh, that uh, we can do or available to us. So we're gonna go ahead and click on tenant dash uh, one. First, uh, uh, within the identity and tenant management, uh, you have three tabs. We're gonna explore each one of them. The tenant admins, the directories and product association. So, and we're starting with the tenant admins there. This is gonna list uh, all the uh, uh, tenant admin uh, that are uh, available now. Uh, so uh, you can see that I've already added tenant-1.admin during the instantiation or the creation of this tenant that I'm working with here or exploring. If I need to add another local uh, uh, tenant admin, I can simply click on add tenant admin and simply provide the username and password, first name, last name, email, and then save that. Since I already have one and I don't need, I don't have a need for another, I'm gonna cancel and go to the other option, search and assign. Now this search and assign happens if there is already uh, local accounts uh, in the uh, VIDM copy that we copied from the provider or to this tenant, we can search for all local users as well as any Active Directory that we've synced to the uh, to, to VIDM. So in this case, uh, I search for my Active Directory account, Cloud Admin, and I have added it here, and I can simply assign it a Tenant Admin. So now I have an Active Directory-based account that has Tenant Admin privileges that can uh, do uh, a day two operation on the tenant. Next, we're gonna talk about directories. And that's the second tab. If, once we select the directories within an existing tenant, we can look at a list of the directory it has access to or where we already copied some directories during the creation of the tenant. If we need to add more directories, we can simply add, uh, click on the add directories option. And then here we can select the directory that should be migrated again from the base tenant or the provider org to tenant dash one if there was additional directory uh, uh, in the base tenant. But at this time, there isn't. That's why we don't see uh, any directory that we can show here because we've already added the available and the only available directory in the base tenant. Now, a couple of things here. The LCM allows you to only copy directories from the provider org AKA the master, the default, the base tenant, they all refer to the same thing, um, to the subtenant we're working with here, which is tenant-1. Two, tenant admin uh, can directly log in into the subtenant UI, so the uh, VIDM for tenant-1, the instance that we created, and add new directory directly there. Once you do that, it automatically will show up here in the list which we saw on the previous screen, since LCM reads live data from VIDM anyway and displays them in LCM. So even if it's added outside of LCM uh, and in VIDM directly. Hope that was, uh, was clear. Final tab is the product association. It's the same story here. Um, you, we look at the list, what product this tenant is associated with today. And if we need to add 
uh, a new product association. Let's say we've built another environment and we've associated it uh, already to the same LCM. Now we can go in here and say, hey, tenant one needs also access to that uh, environment. So we can click on add product association and we should see the products, uh, the product listed here. But again, because LCM only has one instance of uh, VRA, and it's already been added and associated with tenant, you can see it here in the list. Finally, we get to the validating of the tenants VIDM and VRA instances. What we're gonna validate here is the default tenant, master tenant or base tenant or provider org. And to do that, we simply access the VIDM first instance by just simply going to HTTPS the, the FQDN of the default dash tenant that we've created, or only in, uh, in, uh, in, um, only in, uh, in the single deployment case, we can still use the original idm.vmwarelab.local URL, which will redirect you back anyway to the default dash tenant VIDM URL. Um, uh, so what you see on the screen here is this the the top left the top right corner you see default tenant so you know that you're you are in the instance of the default tenant you can take a look here at the config admin in the middle of the screen which is a system domain uh, which part of the system domain here this is the configuration admin that we've used when we created this using or we deployed VRA using the easy installer uh, and the, the rest are basically synced from the OU. Uh, or based on the group that I synced with uh, VIDM. If we look at accessing VRA for the provider org, you simply use the main VRA FQDN. And to do that, we simply say VR, vra.vmwlab.local. And on the top corner, you'll see that the, uh, you'll see IDM uh, based on the name of the VIDM appliance that we used that we're using here so it took that the first name of the fqdn idm.vmwarelab.local became the tenant the default tenant for or the provider org uh, uh, instance here and of course i have access to all the services within within uh, within vra now we move on to validating the tenants and VIDM and VRA instances for our tenants. And in, th in this example, we're going to hit on tenant-1 uh, that we created. To access VIDM instance for tenant-1, we use, again, the FQDN hostname that we've created that's pointing to the VIDM IP address, as, as if you remember. And we use HTTPS tenant-1 vmwlab.local. And if you look at the top right corner, you'll see that the tenant-1 is the tenant we're attached to. And if you look through the user list, you do not see the config admin that was there for the provider org. But what you see here is the new tenant admin user that we've created when we created tenant-1, and that's tenant-1.admin. So this is a complete replica copy that was moved from the base or copied from the base tenant or the provider org to tenant-1 and now you can use it the, the tenant-1 can use it and can add more directories if they need to or more or onboard or sync more users completely isolated from the provider org or any other tenant uh, uh, instances vidm instances on the VRA side, we will to access VRA, we will use the C name uh, the, uh, record that we created, and that's HTTPS tenant one vra vmwarelab local. And you can see on the top right corner, uh, tenant one being represented there. The name is right there, the, the name of the tenant, and of course the URL is completely different than the provider org or tenant two, which we will not be uh, showcasing here because it's pretty much the same thing. Now moving on to the last topic of this presentation and uh, which is the VRLize op orchestrator options that are available to us with multi-tenancy. A couple of things here. The default tenant will always have the same embedded VRO integrated out of the box. So when you log into the, uh, um, to the default or to the provider org, uh, 
which is the default tenant. Uh, and here you see I'm logged into vra.vmrlab.local. Under the in infrastructure integration, I can automatically see the embedded VRO instance. That doesn't happen for any additional tenants as they will not have any pre-registered VRO integration as you can see at the bottom screenshot. Here I'm logged into tenant-1 and you can clearly see I have no uh, integration with any type of uh, virtualized orchestrator uh, instances. So what does that mean? Any additional tenants will have the ability to add new integration. The options are for them, the tenant options are they can add the default embedded VRO if they, given, if they were given permissions, or they can have and spin up their own standalone VRA, uh, VRO 8.1 and uh, basically add that as an external VRO that uses, as long as the VRO instance uses multi-tenancy uh, or VRA as the auth provider. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in the next slide. Now, any VRO using multi-tenancy as the auth provider or VRA as the auth provider, they can pre-register to any, that they, can be, that they can be registered to any of the tenants by creating new integration and providing VRO FQDN without providing any, any credentials. And I'll show you this in the next slide. All right. So this is uh, uh, what we what I did here is I stood up a, a standalone VRO 8.1 and I'm going to add an external VRO uh, with the with VRA auth provider. So uh, I, 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 I you I logged in with root into the standalone VRO and we you go and select the configure authentication provider. You make sure that you that the authentication mode is set to uh, VRA uh, auth provider, which is VRLized automation, and you simply put the host address, which is the tenant URL for VRA. So you can see here HTTPS tenant dash one dot VRA dot VMware lab dot local. You hit connect. You will be presented with the certificate. Accept the certificate and then simply provide the tenant admin username and password. And in our case for tenant one, it's tenant-1.admin, provide the password, save the changes. And now I have configured the authentication provider uh, to, to, uh, and registered it with, the, with, the, with, the, with one of the, with the first tenant. Now, if I go into uh, tenant one, I can go to the integration and I can simply add VRO as an external type integration and simply point it to the FQDN of the VRO appliance dot four, four, three, validate that and hit save. And then here you go. Uh, I have the integration. And now if I go out and click on the, uh, orchestrator service, uh, then I can log in and access my workflows. Uh, for this tenant now, the tenant one, you can see right now on the top uh, left corner, it says tenant one. And also on the top right corner, it says tenant dash one. So tenant dash one now can use uh, the standalone VRO for any extensibility workflows that they might need uh, to use in any of the extensibility or the subscription events that they have. With that, that concludes our video uh, for enabling multi-tenancy. Uh, hope uh, uh, it was uh, worth the time and thank you very much.